singing Christmas hymns um, in spring-like weather. Amen. Amen. But, but yet it is uh, the season of celebrating uh, the birth of our Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to say that I had a very unique experience as you're turning to our uh, uh, scripture passage this morning, Jeremiah 20 uh, and verse 9. A very unique uh, experience uh, on last Sunday and one that uh, has not been afforded to me uh, very often over the last 20 to 22 years. Uh, and that was to be able to actually sit in worship uh, with my family. Uh, normally I'm up here uh, and they're out there, but uh, we were with my son in uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas at the uh, uh, Greater Pleasant Hill Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, it's a very odd feeling to be sitting with my family in worship, amen? But I counted a blessing, but I also had a different perspective. Uh, that I found very distracting, and I shared it on Wednesday night, because uh, the people in front of me were talking, they were texting, uh, they were doing everything but paying attention to worship, amen? So I think the Lord wanted me to appreciate sitting uh, in worship with my family, but I also think he wanted me to see what the view is like from the pew, amen? Amen. Uh, I know that doesn't happen here. Uh, Jeremiah 20, uh, in verse 9, you'll find recorded the, these words, and uh, my emphasis is basically coming from verses 11 through uh, 18 or thereabout, but I want to read verse 9, which is very familiar. Uh, then, then, then I, this is Jeremiah speaking, then I said, I will not make mention of him, uh, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Now, eternal and gracious Father, we, oh God, pause now as we've offered our praise, our adoration, as we've uh, offered even our giving unto you. We pause now, God, and ask that through your holy and, oh God, your wonderful word, that you speak uh, directly to our situations, you speak directly to our lives. Father, we come with the audacity and the faith to know that your scripture and your word has relevance for our lives and that you have something to say about what we are going through. And so, Father, as we, O oh God, in our, our, our humanity attempt to preach uh, from this great prophet Jeremiah, we pray, God, that words that were written so many thousand years ago would resonate even uh, in our contemporary time and setting as many uh, may be dealing with the same disparity and loss of hope uh, that Jeremiah and the children of Israel were experiencing. Father, we pray that as we worship you, that our intimacy with you might grow uh, stronger, that we might grow closer to you. Father, we pray that the impact of your word might convert sinners and encourage those who are already saved. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we adore you, and we are attempting to love you as our Lord says, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As, uh, as you were seated uh, this morning, I, I would that you would consider uh, this thought at the end of my rope. At the end of my rope. I had a privilege of sitting in a uh, seminar a couple weeks ago at Temple Israel with a rabbi from uh, New York by the name of Rabbi Jeffrey K. Salkin. And Jeffrey K. Salkin uh, has a very interesting book in which uh, he attempts to explain uh, the existence and the work of God to teenagers. Uh, and, and, and that was rather arresting and interesting to me because uh, what, what he discovered is trying to explain the existence and uh, the work of God to a teenager, particularly uh, using antiquated biblical language, can be quite difficult. And so uh, in his particular book, he, he, he asked some teenagers, uh, how do you know that God is there? 
Uh, and I wonder to you, as you reach moments uh, in your life where uh, you may be filled with despair and hopelessness and you're feeling all alone, how do you know that God is there? Uh, and Rabbi uh, Salkin, he, uh, he, he talks to teenagers and he said, he said, you know, God is like the internet. Uh, and, and please understand that all of our, our, our human language is, is often limited in when, when we're trying to explain God. But, but he tells the teenagers, trying to relate to them, that God is like the internet. And, so, and, and the reason why he says you know God is there because you can access God. And then he goes on to say that uh, your Wi-Fi password to connect with God is Jesus. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? Now, 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 now he, he wanted the teenagers to understand that the ever-present God is really only experientially present with you when you are connected. Now, now the internet is always there. But it only is there for you in your experience when you are connected. And you can only be connected if you have the right password. Are you going to pray with me here today? And so if you are not connected, then what you feel is the ever-present absence. God is always there. But if we are not connected, then what we feel is the ever-present absence. Yes. And so we find with Jeremiah and the children of Israel, uh, because of their lack of intimacy, uh, their, their lack of being connected to God, that they are experiencing this ever-present absence. Uh, they know in their theology and in their worship that God is omnipresent, that God is always there, that God will never leave nor forsake us. But in their experience, they are feeling as if God is not there. And I don't know, I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but there can be times in our life when we, we know God is there, but we cannot feel his presence. Uh, when we're feeling pain and anguish and depression and despair and, and, and we call out to God. Yes. But, but it just seems like God is not there. But I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, that God is always there. And if we're feeling uh, this void and this absence, it has more to do with our intimacy than it has to do with God. Yes. Jeremiah said, I thought that I would forget him. That I no longer speak in his name, but there is an intense fire in my heart, trapped in my own. I'm drained, trying to contain it. I'm unable to do it. Verse 10 says, I hear many people whispering. Panic lurks everywhere. We find Jeremiah at a point where he's asking the question, is life worth living? Reverend Caligon made mention of a football player in Kansas City. Uh, that was faced with the question, is life worth living? Whenever we hit a point of despair and despondency and we are not connected to God, we find ourselves grappling with these questions of existence. We begin to question our calling, our purpose in life. God, why am I here? Why are you leaving here to experience pain and agony uh, and suffering? We not only begin to question a purpose and a calling in life, but we even begin to question God. Yes, yes, yes. God, what is your plan? God, uh, what are you doing? I'm trying to trace your steps, but you're not making any sense. I know you work in mysterious ways, but your mysteriousness is causing me pain and agony. Your mysteriousness is causing me to have some sleepless nights. God, give me some insight. As to what you're doing in my life, but then we also begin to question even our own existence. God, why am I here? But you know, through Jeremiah, God says in that 29th chapter, the 11th verse, I, I know the plans that, that, I said, that I have for you. They, they are plans not to destroy you, but to give you a future and to give you hope. And so my brothers and sisters, when we reach the point where we're at the end of our rope, what can we do? 
We find from Jeremiah in the midst of his complaint that we need to tell God about it rather than bottling it up on the inside. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? We live in a society uh, that is based on individualism. And in our individualism, we have disconnected ourselves from God. Thinking that we can work it out, we can figure it out. But I want you to understand the Bible is full of individuals. Let me call it Elijah. Elijah got to the point where he felt like he was all by himself. And Elijah was praying that God would just take his life. But God stepped in and said, Elijah, stay connected to me. David reached a point of despair where he almost was going to let go. But God stepped in and gave him hope. Jonah was about to let go. But God stepped in and said, Jonah, don't let go. And so what I want you to understand is I'm not trying to offer you psychology, but testimony. Because when you reach the end of your rope, you don't need psychology. You don't need nobody trying to figure out your mind. You need a God who created you. In his image and in likeness, who already knows everything about you. And God will not give you psychology. He'll give you testimony that God is good in the midst of your situation. God is good and present in the midst of your circumstances. So we find here from Jeremiah a psalm of praise in the pit of despair. We'll find that God will give you the gift of faith in the depths of your suffering at the end of his rule. As Jeremiah is experiencing the dark night of his soul, we find faith evidenced in complaint. And I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, it is not a lack of faith when we cry out to God and tell God the truth. You see, often when we come to God, we come to God uh, in our prim and proper uh, worship regalia. We come oh, oh, to God and we've got pain and agony in our heart, but we don't tell God the truth. We don't tell God that we hurt. We don't tell God that we're struggling. We don't tell God that, God, we need you to step in right now. But Jeremiah is honest with God. He said, God, I'm about to give up on you. I'm about to give up on life. God, you got to step in right now. Go ahead. But as we look at the life and history of Jeremiah in its entirety, we'll see that God provides answers before we even raise the question. Because in Jeremiah chapter 1, God tells Jeremiah, before you were born, I formed you. Uh, I set you apart. Now, I want you to understand something. God is basically saying right there, I'm already giving you the answer before you ever come up with the question. And what it literally means, God is saying, I am sovereign. And so right before chapter 20, God reminds Jeremiah once again of his sovereignty because as we understand the context of these chapters uh, in connection, we see in chapter 18 that God talks about uh, the potter and the clay. And God wants to remind Jeremiah and the children of Israel that God himself is the power, meaning he is the creator. And we are the clay. We are creatures. And whatever we go through in life, we're always in the hands of the power. We might be cracked. We might be hurting. But we're still in his hands. And so whatever we're going through, it is by God's doing. And God is going to work it out for our good. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? And so you might be feeling like you're all alone, but God, my brothers and sisters, has you in his hand. So when you are knocked down, I don't know if you've ever felt like it before, have you ever been just knocked down? And when you are knocked down, you got two choices. You can stay down or you can get up. When you're knocked down, you can either stay down or you can get up. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? And what you need to understand as believers, we may be discouraged but never defeated. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? God will give you a standing aid count so you can catch your breath and get back up. Are you going to pray with me here today? But while you are going through your standing aid count, you got to pray and you got to trust. 
when we get knocked down. What we often want to do is wait. Now when I say wait, I'm not talking about biblical waiting. I'm talking about just sitting there waiting for stuff to work itself out on its own. But biblical waiting is not sitting there waiting for stuff to work itself out on its own. There's something you got to do. You got to pray and you got to trust God. But then sometimes we wait for things to work out on their own, but sometimes we just sit and meditate. We sit and just meditate until it just gets worse and worse and worse, and then at other times, we just get on other folk's nerves. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? But the Bible says we got to pray and we got to trust God. As we look uh, at the story of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20, I call to mind a famous writer by the name of Max Lucado. And Max Lucado has a book many of you may have and I have myself entitled uh, In the Grip of Grace. Uh, and part one of his book basically describes almost the situation that Jeremiah is in. Because the first part of his book is entitled, What a Mess. Have you ever been at a point in life where you feel like everything is just a mess? I mean, you wake up and you see mess. You go out and you see mess. You look at your bank book and you see there's somebody going to pray with me here today. You see mess. Uh, you look at yourself in the mirror and you see mess. And when all you see is mess, it can lead you to despair. Jeremiah is looking and all Jeremiah sees is a mess. He sees people that will not listen to the prophet. They will not listen to the word of God. He's warning them that they are headed to Babylon. But I want you to know something. All of us have to have our Babylon experience. Because our Babylon experience is a reminder that we have lost intimacy with God. And so Babylon is really not a bad place if it's going to remind us that we've lost our intimacy with God. We don't love him like we used to love him. We don't talk to him like we used to talk to him. We don't pray to him like we used to pray. We don't sing like we used to pray. We don't listen to the word like we used to listen. And so thank God for Babylon. Because it's only in Babylon that we can be redirected back to the God of our weary years and the God of our silent tears. In the midst Jeremiah focusing on what a mess he's in. He begins to praise God for what a God he is. And that's the unique perspective of a believer. We can see a mess, but in the midst of our mess, we can say, what a mighty God we serve. I know you got a testimony of how God has brought you through. I know you know that you've been in it before. And God will bring you through it again. It might be a mess, but God is greater than your mess. It might be trouble all that you need, but there's a bright side. Somewhere, y'all gonna be with me. Oh. Max Lucado says, not only is it a great mess, not only is it a great God, but in the midst of our mess, when we realize that there is such a great God, we begin to realize what a difference God makes in the midst of our situation. And I want you to know something, that the only one who can make a difference, my brothers and sisters, is God. And as we think about my brothers and sisters this first Sunday, and as we celebrate the grace of God, I want you to understand something, that there's something wrong with the title of my sermon at the end of my rule. Because what's wrong with the title is, for those who live by grace, you must understand that in truth, you never had a rope to hold on to in the first place. You are in the grip. 